from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi, everyone. I'm Mary Quattlebaum. I'm the regular reviewer of middle grade and teen fiction for the Washington Post Book World, and I'm here to welcome you to the National Book Festival. The Washington Post is a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival and has been a big supporter for all 10 years of its existence. Um, I know that you're going to be excited about asking the author questions, and I just wanted to remind you that there's going to be a Q&A session at the end of their talk, and there are mics right here. So rather than trying to stand up at your seats and shout out your questions, you can actually go to the mic. So as I said, the National Book Festival has been going on for 10 years, um, and it just keeps getting more and more amazing. And what makes the festival amazing is you guys, the attendees, and of course, the authors. I'm about to introduce two people who together have an incredible story to share. Philip Hose has published a number of books for young people that shine a light on overlooked parts of history. We Were There Too is about young people in United States history. It was a finalist for the National Book Award. Other titles include It's Our World Too, about youth activism, and The Race to Save the Lord God Bird, which made the Washington Post's best book for young people in 2004. Philip's most recent book is Claudette Colvin, Twice Toward Justice, and it garnered big awards, a Newbery Honor, a National Book Award, and a place on the Washington Post's Best Books for Young People list. It's a book that explores two wrongs done to Claudette Colvin in the segregated South of the 1950s. And we actually, very happily, have Claudette here today with us to share her experiences. So I just want to say a few words about Claudette. She grew up in Alabama. When she was 15 and arrested on a segregated bus, she shouted that her constitutional rights were being violated, and indeed they were. Claudette later became a nurse's assistant and recently retired from that career. She now lives in the Bronx and is recognized as a pioneer of the civil rights movement. So let's welcome <laughs> Philip Hose and Claudette Colvin. Thank you very much. I will start and um, then turn the microphone and the show over to, to Claudette. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to thank the sponsors of this fabulous event for inviting us to come. I mean, imagine 150,000 book lovers in one place all at once. I mean, that, that's, there's the shout out right there. Um, I, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I grew up in Indiana, very, um, very much convinced that there was nothing good about me. You know, that there was nothing I could do, that I, I had no talent, I wasn't very big, I was, uh, you know, not very hefty, girls didn't seem to pay any attention to me at all, I wasn't very athletic. And in eighth grade, I think it was, I wrote a theme in English class that my teacher Mrs. Hildebrand praised and in fact put out in the glass case out beside, out in the, in the hallway and during open house, during parent-teacher night, my parents saw that and uh, something clicked, the idea that maybe I had some little knack of being a writer and I think it was that right there that, that made me get started with this. I started out in my career writing a number of books for adults. I wrote a book called Hoosiers about high school basketball in Indiana. Thank you. 
and I wrote a book called Necessities about racial barriers in uh, American sports. My career really took a bend when I started having daughters. And I, I began to, you know, just listen to, to what they had in mind. I wrote um, a book called It's Our World Too about uh, so young social activists when my elder daughter Hannah did something really good at, at school. And I thought there must be, you know, dozens and dozens of stories like this. And I collected them into a book. I then wrote a book, uh, you know, I, w I interviewed uh, a girl named Sarah Rosen, who was a 13-year-old girl from um, South Bend, Indiana, during that process. And um, we were talking, and she said, you know what the real crime is? I said, no, what's the real crime? She said, the real crime is that there's nobody my age in my United States history book. I said, that can't be true. She said, go find a middle school history book and see for yourself. So I did. Borrowed a book, took it home, it took me a while to read it, and she was almost right. There were two teens in a 676-page book, Sacagawea and Pocahontas, both teenage girls who guided whites who kept journals, and thus they uh, got into history. I went back to Sarah and said, you know, you're right. How does that make you feel? And Sarah said, it makes me feel as though I'm not real and I won't be real until I'm about 20. And I, something about it got to me, and I, I wanted to change that. So I spent the next six years reading and researching and writing a book entitled We Were There Too, Young People in U.S. History, trying to restore or bring to the national story the experiences, the bravery, the courage, the muscle, the, the hope and righteousness of youth into the national story. Thank you. When I, I was doing this research, it occurred to me that there was no episode in United States history in which young people played a stronger role or made more of a difference than the Civil Rights Movement. And if you think about it, it makes sense because the first major episode in the Civil Rights Movement was all about, all about young people. It was about students. It was the Supreme Court ruling Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka in 1954 that said that public schools had to be segregated, had to be integrated, racially integrated with, as they said, all deliberate speed. And some communities sure took their time, some up to 20 years, to integrate their schools. And during my research for that, I found all sorts of stories uh, about young people who had been courageous and who had really stuck their necks out uh, for for equal rights and, and for justice. And I started looking for a character, a person, that I could write one book about. You know, just one single person out of all those really dozens and dozens of young people. And I came upon this, this story uh, about a girl named Claudette Colvin, um, who as a 15-year-old growing up in Montgomery, Alabama, took the stand that Rosa Parks became famous for, but did it nine months earlier. That is, she refused to surrender her public bus seat to a white passenger when ordered to do so by uh, a bus conductor. And uh, according to the story, she, she, you know, caught the worst of it. Uh, she was treated very, very roughly, uh, arrested by police, dragged off the bus, thrown into a police car, jailed. Um, but I had really never heard anything about this. Um, I began to research it and became more and more intrigued for a couple reasons. One was not only did she refuse to surrender her seat and take a, a private stand on this public bus system, but she had the guts a year later, and almost nobody knew this, to join a lawsuit, a class action lawsuit, claiming that the segregation laws on the buses of, of Alabama were unconstitutional. It violated the Constitution to separate people by race. When I was uh, doing this research, I came ac across a couple of articles and a chapter in a, in a children's book that made it seem as though 
if I could find Claudette Colvin, if she were still alive and I could find her and she would agree to be interviewed by me, that it would be a terrific story because I don't think a story is any good, really, unless the person inside it really comes out. And I thought, from what I had read, that you could still find the girl in that story, that, that how she felt about this, what made her so angry, um, why she did what she did, what did that do to her popularity at school, did she get in trouble with her parents, the kinds of things that, that young readers want to know and that I want to know, I felt would be available if I could find Claudette Colvin and she would agree to work with me on a, a story about her, her youth. Um, finding Claudette Colvin was not and is not the easiest thing in the world to do. Claudette uh, lives in New York City, has an unlisted telephone number, and I tried for quite some time to, to find a way to reach her. Finally, I read an article in, in uh, USA Today by an, an author, a, a journalist who I, I kind of hope is here today, Richard C. Willing, uh, in 1995 did a retrospective on the Montgomery bus boycott and included uh, what two teenage girls had done, Claudette and Mary Louise Smith, another bus protester. And when I read the article that Richard Willing had written, it was clear that he had talked with Claudette Colvin, so she must still be alive and this person must still know how to reach her. So I called USA Today and found Richard Willing and talked with him and I said, would you be willing to uh, relay a message to Claudette Colvin if you're still in touch with her? And he said, you know, and I said that I would like to work with her on a book project. And he said I would. And a couple of months later, I got a response back from Richard Willing saying I have talked to Claudette Colvin and her answer is maybe when I retire. So I made a, a little note in my calendar to ask the same question six months later. So I did this twice a year for four years. And always Richard relayed this message back that Ms. Colvin says, maybe when I retire. I was never gonna give up, but I certainly didn't want to harass Claudette Colvin, I mean, even indirectly. And I had really lost much hope that, that this project would ever occur and one night, I think it was in the fall of 2006, I came home from something and the red light was beeping on my telephone answering machine. And it was a message from Richard Willing, the reporter from USA Today, and his message was very brief. It said, Claudette Colvin says she'll talk with you. Here is her telephone number, good luck. <laughs> well, I couldn't sleep that night. You know, I, I stayed up scribbling questions and so forth, and the next day, the next morning, I called the number that Richard Willing had given me, and a woman answered, and she said, yes, indeed, she was Claudette Colvin, and we talked for, I guess, about an hour, and at the end of the, the conversation, you know, we, I thought it was a great conversation, and I said, may I come visit you to talk further about whether we'd wanna do this together, and she permitted me to do so, Maybe a month later, I went down to, to New York City and we met in a restaurant and spent, gosh, you know, most of the day uh, talking and agreed to, to do this project together, to write this book uh, together. Um, I asked her, I asked Claudette at that time, we, we had a big decision to make. Do we want this book to be mainly for adults or did we want the book mainly to be for young readers. And um, Claudette said very emphatically, uh, I would like this book to get into schools. So that was the answer to the question right there. <laughs> you know, so we launched and uh, the, the process of, of writing this book took, I don't know, maybe about a year and a half it involved a number of interviews with Claudette, long interviews, some in person, some over the phone. And it also involved uh, 
Claudette was, was wonderful in that she um, encouraged people who were important to her to talk with me. So I, I had full access not only to, to Claudette, who has an incredible memory for detail um, and how she felt and what happened during those years, which were, you know, a while ago. But uh, also I, I was able to talk to some of her friends. I was able to talk to other characters who were important. And I did a fair amount of traveling uh, during this time, too. I went to Montgomery, Alabama, where this story was staged uh, a couple of times and talked with people. And I also went to the Library of Congress right here, which had a great deal of information and some photographs, some images that we uh, included in the book. And it was, it was quite wonderful to work uh, with the Library of Congress. And you know, as the story developed, as I learned more about Claudette and what she went through and, and the courage that it took to do the things that she, that she did, my eyes really, really opened. For one thing, I worry that the, the memory of how Jim Crow felt, you know, how it felt to live in segregated society with all those rules and all those horrible signs and all the customs and all the demeaning traditions and so forth, I'm worried that the feeling of it uh, will be lost. You know, that, yeah, we'll have Dr. King Day every once a year, and yes, we'll have Black History Month, but the same stories will get told over and over and over again, and the same heroes will shrink and congeal and curl up at the edges, and that the day-to-day -day memory of what it was like for people will be lost. The feeling, the, the feelings of, of humiliation, the feelings of anger, just what it felt like day to day would be lost. And that was one thing that I, as an author, wanted to do. That was one aim of mine, to do what I could uh, through this story to restore and refresh how horrible that, uh, that and unjust that indignity uh, was. And of course, you know, as I went through it, and I went through the process of it, my respect and admiration for Claudette and the enormous courage that it took and the enormous contributions that she made grew and grew and grew almost by the day. I mean, imagine being 15 and taking the stand that she did, that is refusing to get up, being hauled off to jail, having that cell door closed, and then having the courage uh, um, you know, I mean, she can tell you herself what the reaction was to, to the stand that she took, but then having the courage to do round two. Uh, very little is known about Browder versus Gale, which is the lawsuit that really ended the Montgomery bus boycott. And it's really curious. I, I have no idea why this is the case. I really do think that most people who care about the Montgomery bus boycott see it as something that ended in quite a different way than it did. I think most people think that you know, Dr. King in, the, in all the boycotting and all the days of not riding the bus just wore the bus company down until they gave up. That's not true at all. I mean, they weren't going to give up. Uh, they were digging in their heels. And the, the boycott itself was in a bit of trouble. That boycott was ended by a lawsuit called Browder versus Gale in which four plaintiffs representing the ridership, the African-American ridership, of Montgomery, Alabama, lodged a suit in federal court claiming that uh, segregation on the buses, the public buses, interstate buses, was unconstitutional. Well, I mean, the odds weren't really very good that they would win something like that because the federal courthouse was down in Montgomery. But the people who organized the lawsuit thought that because it was in a federal jurisdiction, the United States and not a local jurisdiction, you know, they just might have a chance. But the big problem that they had was getting anyone to be on the lawsuit, to sign up for the lawsuit publicly, to put your name on a lawsuit as the plaintiffs. After all the trying that they did, they only found four people who had the guts to put their name on that lawsuit. All four were women, and two of them were teenagers. Claudette, who was 16 at the time of the lawsuit, and Mary Louise Smith, who I think was 19 by then. She was probably, I think she was 19. Claudette's testimony, uh, what she said to the three-judge panel, the questions she was asked, the responses that she gave, are in this book, 
Claudette Colvin twice toward justice, but I can tell you that it, it, it couldn't have been easy. And uh, I don't think you can read what she did without just uh, swelling up in admiration. Um, it, it was just an incredible contribution to U.S. history and one that just we couldn't afford to lose. And I, I'll just conclude by saying, you know, a, as an author, I was, I was really worried about two things when I finally uh, came to understand Claudette's story a little bit. I was afraid, first of all, that the story itself would be lost, that, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know about this person. I mean, I don't know of a story, and I've researched this as much as anybody, where one single teen, one single young person made as much a difference as Claudette Colvin did. I don't think there's a, there's a parallel uh, to it. But in addition to just being ignored and overlooked, a lot of the mainstream, the big deal history books would include her. They did include her in a, in a paragraph, but it was the wrong paragraph. She was in danger of being portrayed wrongly as the person who was not Rosa Parks, as somebody who was, you know, sort of mouthy and a teenager and somebody that you really kind of didn't have to take seriously. And, you know, the more I talked to her and the more I understood who she was and what she had done, I realized what a terrible injustice it would be if that were the last word, if it were left to that. So not only did I want to restore her story, but I kind of want to straighten out the picture on the wall, you know, to make it a, a right picture. Uh, I have to say that uh, it's been one of the, the great pleasures of my life to, to get to know Claudette. I mean, not only do I admire her uh, and, and thank her for sharing that part of her life with me, but she's just a wonderful friend, and uh, it, that's been a great, a great joy. So I will leave the stage, and without further ado, I will introduce you to my partner in literature, Claudette Colvin. Maybe other cities, but not Montgomery. 
So, Vetmont, Mrs. Geraldine Nesby, and Mrs. Josie Lawrence. Mrs. Josie Lawrence was my history teacher, and Mrs. Geraldine Nesbitt was my um, literature teacher. And we discussed all the injustices that was perpetrated on the black community uh, in Montgomery City. And then we discussed the heroes. And amongst them, some of the heroes, two of my favorite were females. That was Harriet Tubman, and Sojourner True. Then we discuss other heroes like Jackie Robinson breaking the baseball barrier, and then we go in into W.E. Du Bois and then uh, Frederick Douglass. Well, we did we did the whole thing, the whole month. So I said, that's why I said it was. It felt like Harriet Tubman was push me down on one shoulder. And so John and Truth were pushing me down on the other side. I was embraced spiritually by the struggle and the bravery of these two women. So I said they picked the wrong day to pick on me, the bus motorman. But anyway, he told you this story. But as a child, past experiences, not being able to go in the store and oh, the aroma of the five and 10 in those days, not today, but in those days. The popcorn, the peanuts, and then we couldn't sit at the lunch, lunch counter where white children would sit. And then they made it where you couldn't pass by that aisle anyway. So if I was, as a little girl, I would look across there and I would see the white kids and I don't know whether they was eating anything any better. But my mama said, honey, are you hungry? She said, I would take you to get your hot dog. That is in the back section where only a little counter for Negroes. So anyway, those childhood experiences. And furthermore, you couldn't try on hats. And do, but may I demonstrate? Let me take off my shoes. Now, do you think a white person would try on a pair of shoes that you, a black person have taken their feet out of? in 1950, do you think so? So that's what we went through. That was one of the things, that's why I, that's the reason I said history, the history of how we were treated had me glued to the seat and I wasn't gonna move that day, nothing. I refused, they said, oh my God, you refused? I refused to walk off the bus, so two policemen, they manhandled and pulled me off the bus, put me in this patrolman car and handcuffed me and took me to jail, booked me and everything. And the horror that I said, I really went through what some of Edgar Allan Poe's poems had explained. I really went through H-E-L-L. -L. But when that door of the jail went, cool it, I knew I was shut in. But you know what? Uh, I hate to say that. I feel like one of those sisters in a Baptist church. <laughs> After Barack Obama became president, I said, I feel good. <laughs> Thank God Almighty. Martin Luther King is not here. And all some of all the people, and first of all, I was crying tears because the four girls in Birmingham were murdered because of equal rights. So, I feel good Barack Obama became president of the United States. So I don't care whether he's a, come out as being a good president or a bad president. He broke that barrier. He went in the front door of the White House. And thank God. I think that I played a significant role in the beginning of that. Thank you all. We would be glad to answer any questions that, that we can. <laughs> 
Uh, and uh, I think you go to the mic. There are microphones in the aisle. Yeah. Good morning. My question is, what happened the next day at school when you got back to class? I didn't, excuse me, I didn't go back to school the next day. I was too traumatized. I was too traumatized. <laughs> Oh, uh, but when I did go back, the, uh, the parents had, the other parents, not my parents, but the student parents had convinced them, oh my God, that girl that Carly, that girl is crazy. Stay away from her. That's funny. I was just about to ask you, like, how did everyone in your neighborhood, like, react? Like, we got it. <laughs> I haven't read the book yet, but what happened after you, how did you get out of jail? Did your parents come get you? Uh, my, my mother and Reverend H.H. H. Johnson came in and got me out of church. And what did your mother say to you? Well, I had been discussing that because uh, before this happened, this, just, this is just one of the stories. And when I was in the ninth grade, one of our students a male student was arrested for allegedly raping a white woman. But he was actually having consensual, con I cannot put it, say it, say it, say it. Con say it. Consensual sex. Consensual? C consensual sex. Consensual sex with this white woman. But they had him, they demonized him and said that he was a serial <laughs> rapist during the summer. And he was on death row when I was arrested. So you. my parents, they said they they wouldn't uh, they, they wouldn't uh, remain seated. But my mom said I just couldn't ride that bus. She was just gotten off the bus. Oh, thank you. Uh -huh. What you did? Yeah. How did they treat African Americans in jail? Did you hear that? Ba part? Bad part. How did they treat African Americans in jail? I do. I don't know. I mean, I don't know really. I didn't stay. I didn't spend the night. But you know, I never, you know, they, they, if, if a white person got fair treatment, then you know they got worse than a white person. So were there people who were not surprised that you did this? People were not surprised. Were there people who knew you who were not surprised that you had done this? They, yes, everybody was surprised that I didn't remove when a policeman asked you to get up. Was, but was there anybody who knew something about yes, you that would help explain Yes, they knew that, that I was going that? through this, what they call, I read, I had psych one, because I studied for um, pre-nursing, so I know psych one. Um, the identity crisis that I was going through, right, as a teenager, where the role that I fit in. And the first protest was when I went to school without straightening my hair. Ah. <laughs> question about how the, the writing collaboration worked. Uh, Claudette, did you read the chapters as they were being written, or did you read it just at the end? How did it work where the two of you were working together? Uh, interviews on the telephone and in my apartment. Mm -hmm. And then did you read, the, yeah, you didn't read it until yeah. it was finished? At, at the end, when I had a, a draft finished that I felt was getting there, I went to Claudette's apartment and read the entire thing to her. It took one afternoon, and then we took a break that you know, and then the following day, and we had a tape recorder on the table on her kitchen table in between us, and uh, I, you know, encouraged her to stop me any time anything seemed wrong, either factually wrong or wrong in emphasis or just you know got it wrong and so we'd stop and you know she'd try to correct it make it right you know and then I I kept a recording of it so that I could you know sort of fix it later but but that's what happened I, I ended up reading these manuscripts or this manuscript which really helps me to hear it out loud um, so that anyway that's how it happened there are people over here I'm sorry what changes would you like to see take place, realistic changes, in this country? What real, realistic change? My goodness. 
that is too big a question for me to answer. There are so much going wrong now. And uh, realistically, first I want all children to get a good education. That's the first thing. Okay. Uh, my question is, um, you kept uh, you kept saying that you wouldn't tell your story until you retired, and you might tell it when you're retired. What changed your mind? Oh, uh, well, what changed my mind is that I did an interview with um, Richard Willens uh, from USA Today. He did a story, and. Um, that was, I think, November the 28th, 1995. And our, my working environment is mostly immigrants. And uh, when they saw the picture, this Filipino nurse said, oh my goodness, Ms. Holy, I didn't know that you would do that. Because amongst the workers, I am a softy. <laughs> it's not that I'm a softy, but I have this southern attitude, not that, I'm not salty. So uh, they wanted to know the story, and so I said, well, then my, uh, then the student, uh, my, my co-worker said, you should tell the story. So because everyone thought that Mrs. Parks just sit down and that ended, the, uh, desegregated the buses. So I said, well, I wait till I uh, retire because it's unionized and I didn't want no more labels on me to be in the soft. And that would be in too much tension on the job, you know. So I said, wait till after I retire so I can give him details like I wanted. So are you retired? Yeah, four years. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Have you ever thought about writing an autobiography? Have you ever thought about writing your autobiography? So, uh, yes. Um, right now, uh, I have, wait, uh, one more thing. My uh, grandson is in medical school, and I want him to get out of medical school before I do it, because what I would write, we're going to be criticized because I would write stories that happened in the 1950s, uh, from 1939 when I was born up until the 50s. And these are not beautiful stories. And I want to thank all the, I don't like to use this label, please, I don't like, white liberals for helping us in change this flaw in our country. They march with us and they helped the world see that African American was discriminated against. So I'm not going to do it until I, uh, till my son graduates. That's what I'm trying to say. Yes, sir. Uh, can, can you tell us what you did between the time of the incident um, uh, through the time you were uh, named a plaintiff on the suit, how active were you in the movement during that period? Uh, and and um, uh, especially after the Rosa Parks incident. Uh, be, be, be real brief. I was not active at all. I wasn't active at all, physically active, because I wasn't invited into that movement. I wasn't active. I was busy trying to support my children. I have two boys. I'm a single mother and I had two boys. I was busy working. And how did you become uh, a plaintiff on the suit? They had no other one. They didn't have anyone else. They, they were, just to elaborate, they, they tried, you know, to find people, but the stakes were too high. The price was too high to pay to put your name on a lawsuit against uh, those bus laws then was to expose your family, you know, the people that you knew, your neighborhood. And um, I talked to, to Fred Gray, interviewed him about that, the, the lawyer who put that lawsuit together. 
And uh, it was hard sledding trying to find anybody who would put their, their name on it. And, in, and as I say, you know, in the end, he found only four people, Claudette and, and three others. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Coleman, thank you so much for coming here today to share your inspiring story. I love you, and you're one of my heroes. And thank you, Mr. Hassa, for writing the story. What advice would you have for young people today who want to stand up for something that they believe in? To do it. Stand it up. <laughs> stand it up if you have to stand up for long. Any further questions? Yes. The, the question was, uh, who was supporting the bus company financially during those times? Because uh, they must have been losing money, and they were losing money, and they were losing a ton of money, but there was such cultural support in the city that they just wouldn't let them go down. I mean, I don't know where the money was coming from to keep them going, because they had, in the end, first of all, at the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott, about 75% of all the ridership was African American. And the boycott really did work in that sense, in that not many African Americans rode the bus. So they were losing uh, a ton of money. But uh, I suspect that they were getting some subsidy f from the cities, from the, uh, you know, the business elite in, this, in the cities who, who wanted, wanted that to keep going, because it was a symbol. If they went down, if they stopped operation, that was a concession. So. Uh, that's the way. May I leave with a, a brief reading so you can? Oh, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Were you surprised that you could actually be arrested by that? No, I wasn't surprised. We'll uh, leave with. Uh, I, I have a brief reading from the book, and it's about um, what happened on the bus and what happened afterwards. Um, so it, it goes like this. This is in, in Claudette's voice. So just so you can have some sense, some more sense of just what she went through. One cop grabbed one of my hands and his partner grabbed the other, and they pulled me straight up out of my seat. My books went flying everywhere. I went as limp as a baby. I was too smart to fight back. They started dragging me backwards off the bus. One of them kicked me. I might have scratched one or two of them because I have long nails, but I didn't fight back. I kept screaming over and over, it's my constitutional right. I wasn't shouting anything profane. I never swore, not then, not ever. I was just shouting out my rights. It just killed me to leave that bus. I hated to give that white woman my seat when so many black people were standing. I was crying hard. The cops put me in the back of a police car and shut the door. They stood outside and talked to each other for a minute and then one came back and told me to stick my hands out the open window. He handcuffed me and then pulled the door open and jumped in the back seat with me. I put my knees together and crossed my hands up over my lap and started praying. All ride long they swore at me and ridiculed me. They took turns trying to guess my bra size. They cracked jokes about parts of my body. I recited the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm over and over in my head, trying to push back the fear. I assumed they were taking me to juvenile court because I was only 15, but we were going in the wrong direction. They kept telling me I was going to Atmore, the women's penitentiary. Instead, we pulled up to the police station and they led me inside. More cops looked up when we came in and started calling me thing and whore. They booked me and took my fingerprints. Then they put me back in the car and drove me to the city jail, the adult jail. Someone led me straight to a cell without giving me any chance to make a phone call. He opened the back door and told me to get inside. He shut it hard behind me and turned the key. The lock fell into place with a heavy sound. It was the worst sound I ever heard. It sounded final. It said I was trapped. When he went away, I looked around me. Three bare walls, a toilet, and a cot. Then I fell down on my knees in the middle of the cell and started crying again. I didn't know if anyone knew where I was or what had happened to me. I had no idea how long I would be there. I cried and put my hands together and prayed like I had never prayed before. Meanwhile, this is my voice, 
the schoolmates who had been on the bus had run home and telephoned Claudette's mother at the house where she worked as a maid. Girls went over and took care of the lady's three small children so that Claudette's mother could leave. Mary Ann Calvin called Claudette's pastor, the Reverend H.H. H. Johnson. He had a car, and together they drove to the police station. Now back to Claudette. When they led Mom back, there I was in a cell. I was crying hard, and then Mom got upset too. When she saw me, she didn't bawl me out. She just asked, are you all right? Reverend Johnson bailed me out, and we drove home. By the time we got to my neighborhood, King Hill, word had spread everywhere. All our neighbors came around, and they were just squeezing me to death. I felt happy and proud, but I was afraid that night, too. I had stood up to a white bus driver and two white cops. I had challenged the bus laws. There had been lynchings for that kind of thing. We tumped a highway that led out of Montgomery ran right past our house. It would have been easy for the Klan to come up the hill in the night. My dad sat up all night long with his shotgun. We all stayed up. The neighbors facing the highway kept watch. Probably nobody on King Hill slept that night. But worried or not, I felt proud. I had stood up for our rights. I had done something a lot of adults hadn't done. On the ride home from jail, coming over the viaduct, Reverend Johnson said something to me I'll never forget. He was an adult who everyone respected, and his opinion meant a lot to me. Claudette, he said, I'm so proud of you. Everyone prays for freedom. We've all been praying and praying and praying, but you're different. You want your answer the next morning, and I think you just brought the revolution to Montgomery. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.